is on uh, pelvic floor rehab, a missing link in postnatal uh, low back pain. So postnatal low back pain is a very, very, very commonly uh, seen, addressed concerns. And uh, why are we still lacking into the complete rehab or what points can we improvise or how can we benefit our patients better? So basically, that is what we want to discuss about um, in today's session. So uh, can someone, yeah. I have disabled the waiting room so people can just join and we don't have a disturbance in between the sessions. So we don't have to, you know, uh, uh, take care of uh, the things. And before we start, once again, thanks Larnovate for organizing the awareness webinar and uh, hoping to meet you all soon on 18th and 19th of March, once again, for the hands-on session. And uh, let me uh, give you a short introduction of what WOW is and uh, of our chairman and founder, Dr. Hedde Saiso. So WOW basically is well-being of the world. Okay, so we get many requests that what WOW stands for or um, what is the full form of WOW. So it's well-being of the world, which uh, and through WOW, it, one of the thing is WOW IPRI, that is International Institute of Pelvic Floor Research Rehab and Education. And we are a, we are the only government recognized institute uh, with a legitimate DIPP number from Central Government of India to exclusively work in the field of transgenital transrectal pelvic floor rehab. Right. So our chairman and founder is Dr. Hedde Sai Sir. And uh, Sir is an innovator, an entrepreneur, and an author also, and he's the author of Amazon's bestseller number one book, that is Hicks Manual of Pelvic Floor Rehab. So it is Amazon's bestseller in neurology, Amazon's bestseller number one in neurology, Amazon's bestseller in obstetrics and gynecology, and in physical therapy. And for the contribution which he has made into the field of pelvic floor rehab, he has written a book, he has developed an uh, assessment scale, which is beyond the boundaries of all the assessment scale present till now. There are multiple assessment scale, which we will be all discussing throughout our uh, seven days hands-on and two days, uh, sorry, seven days online and two days hands-on session. So they are, plus there are multiple other innovations on which Sir is working continuously. For, so for all the contribution which he has made into the field of pelvic floor, he is popularly known as father of modern pelvic floor rehabilitation. And it is his vision which is the vision of whole wow team it is my vision and i hope that you also make it your vision because um it is to uh you know break the cultural taboo and make pelvic floor rehab accessible to every single woman and every single man on the globe through innovative technologies and services does not matter what services you are providing does not matter which technology you're using our goal is to irradiate the pelvic floor dysfunction, to minimize the dysfunction as I know you might not like the word irradiate, but yes, if a right step is taken at the right time by the right person, we might not end having pelvic floor dysfunction. We might not end up having pelvic floor dysfunction. So with this, let's start about our today's topic. So I would like to, before we understand why pelvic floor, it's very important to understand that whenever we talk about any postnatal mother or any mother whom you are going to see after the pregnancy. So it is said that once a postnatal, always a postnatal, no matter your child is two years, five years, 10 years, you are always a postnatal mom. Okay. So the changes which has happened into your body after pregnancy, some of them are still consistently there in you, okay? And, and some, some of them would revert, some of them would stay forever. So when we talk about the postnatal period, when we saw the, the tagline, the, the topic name, it was pelvic floor rehab missing link in postnatal uh, back, low back pain. So postnatal low back pain itself can be a very vast thing, right? It can encompass from uh, the phase from, um, you know, immediate postnatal to maybe menopausal or postmenopausal as well. You might, you might feel that, you know, I'm going out of topic, but that's the truth. Okay. So what we are focusing upon, we are focusing upon the acute the subacute and the delayed postpartum phases. So when we say the acute postpartum phase, that is the golden hours, six to 12 hours after the childbirth. Okay. 
so those are the acute uh, the, that is an acute phase you delivered your baby tomorrow today morning at six o'clock so till from six o'clock till the one first day first day post delivery that is your acute postpartum there would be vaginal bleeding that will be still after pains after pains could last till 45 days till the puperium lasts okay so there will be the immediate changes you are seeing that would be the post acute postpartum second would be subacute postpartum that is from two weeks two to six weeks the subacute phase and then the th then is the delay like six months onward okay so these are the phases uh, where like these are the postnatal periods and delayed postpartum that's why i said that uh, up to six months and even longer so we all are postpartum moms okay um, we might have a baby one year old two years old five years old ten years old we are moms we are postnatals okay so what are the changes which happens into the postnatal period whatever changes have happened into the antenatal first of all there will be a reversion of everything so post delivery baby you will have looseness in the body ligaments you will have a uh, flabby tummy okay you will have relaxed ligaments you will have a uh, vaginal bleeding you will have sore breast 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 soreness would be there okay uh uterine after pains would be there edema in the overall body would be there diastasis rectus abdominis will be there back pain will be there hemorrhoids are the possibility you can have with hemorrhoids you can have constipation you can have episio if you have delivered through a normal vaginal delivery you can have an episiotomy site pain if you have de delivered through a cesarean section you might have a cesarean section site pain so you will have a pain you select the site either it is vaginal i mean episiotomy or it is lower abdominal through cesarean section but you will have either of the pain present okay you can have pelvic floor dysfunctions you will have thoracic pains why thoracic pains because of initially when you see we will be going through the journey of uh, motherhood also into this like how beautiful the motherhood is and what musculoskeletal changes happens in the motherhood where we as a you know exercise specialist or we as a healthcare provider can fit ourselves into okay epidural site pain can have uh caesarean uh, side pain as we discussed coccygenia can be there fatigue would be there hair loss the major concern hair loss weight, weight gain excessive flabbiness of the tummy so all these are the physical changes what you are seeing on a postnatal mother if you if you are a mother go back to your time when you delivered and just try to think of your own phase you might be 60 kgs before pregnancy and maybe after pregnancy like after the delivery you are somewhere 75 so that 15 kgs till yesterday till the time you haven't delivered you would not be worried about your weight okay you are will be all fine okay, okay you are still a, uh you know you are a uh, you are a mom to be you have a baby inside so by till to yesterday you were not worried about your weight but today as soon as you have delivered you have a baby suddenly the thought starts coming how will i get back into my shape look at my tummy because till till see during the pregnancy you will not be able to understand the flabby tummy the looseness of the tummy because your tummy would be turgid how is a 38 weeks old tummy okay 38 weeks old tummy is completely turgid like a watermelon right but after the delivery you will really you will realize the looseness the mother would realize oh it's so flabby oh th there are so many stretch marks i didn't th think that they, they, there are these many stretch marks there are a lot more than what i thought of okay when i will be losing my weight and and some of my friends said that you know after delivery almost uh, five six kgs you will lose uh, would be the weight of your whole placenta and everything so you will be that, that down you will come but on the weighing scale i am not that down why okay, there are so many questions fluid retention would be there there would be other issues ongoing which uh, that, that's what that are the physical changes a uh, breast heaviness will be there so uh, after like within one week you will almost double up your breast size what i'm saying double up in the sense does not like doubling up but if you are using a bra of 36 you might need a you might need a 40 bra within one or two weeks why because now your breasts are becoming uh, they're developing more they're producing more milk you you need to feed your baby so the more the baby is going to suckle the more you are going to produce the more you're going to produce the more enlargement will be there so it does not mean the smaller breast feed less 
okay or the larger breast feeds more no every mother is capable enough to fulfill the baby's hunger no matter that mother delivered through vaginal or cesarean that's not today's topic let's not go into it we'll discuss it later maybe during lactation okay so uh, these are the basic physical changes which can happen into a mother okay these are the physical changes second can be the emotional and the psychological changes anxiety postnatal very common postnatal depression okay uh, i'm not worth it okay am i a good mom why did i deliver how will i take care of my household chores how when will i get back to shape when will i start my job back my friends are working i am i'm not working i, I have compromised my career lot many psychosis changes okay some females can even have uh, emotional and psychological changes to an extent where they either develop a suicidal tendency or they develop hatred towards their own baby and even attempt to kill the baby because they feel that the baby is taking all the attention there are a lot of uh, familial issues social issues which do take place into psych into the psychological and emotional changes but there are even the hormonal changes self doubt weight changes which can lead to anxiety and depression behavior okay so acute postpartum care what we have to take care immediately 6 to 12 hours would be breastfeeding mother would be monitored by the nurses and the midwives mostly right a uh, postpartum bleeding would be there uterine contractions would be there episiotomy site pain will be there so you can apply ice packs there are multiple perineal pads which are available so these perineal pads are exclusively available for the episiotomy site pain hazel pads h a z e l hazel pads are there so you can use the episiotomy uh, the the ice application for the area which is painful you can even use uh, infrared radiation once the gynecology the gynec um, allows you obviously after that so you can even use the infrared ir radiations also in order to reduce the oozing and increase the healing of the site okay if there are cesarean scars maybe a uh, scar uh, you would not start with scar management immediately because the scar has to heal yet right but you will take care that it is not getting infected it is not oozing so for that you might give irr on the site of scar okay you will teach the the mother to breastfeed the baby correctly and that is the most important point and uh, very specifically a point to be considered when we are talking about the back pain or when we are talking about the musculoskeletal pain a mother faces postnatally because we need to understand that why what are the reasons for postnatal pain if i ask you what are the reasons for postnatal pain yeah can anyone answer me what why, why do we get postnatal pains i mean back pains commonly yeah anyone okay let us list it weight gain okay laxity thank you mariel so weight gain can be there there can be laxity there would be change of posture pelvic tilts yes hi lima nice meeting you again okay so there would be postural alterations there would be relaxation of the pelvic floor muscle uh, relaxation of the uh, all the muscles which are connecting or and the ligaments which are connecting the pelvic cavity okay weakness of pfm diastasis rectus abdominis alteration into the the alteration into the this your uh, uh, the cog and log the lumbar lordosis will be changed plus the way the baby sits or the the way the, the the mother takes the baby for breastfeeding okay the posture very importantly the posture so now this is the baby and i am a new mom okay i would not be sitting definitely i would be either lying down if i am a cesarean section maybe flat line if i am with a vaginal delivery maybe like this and i need to take i have to have support with my baby i have to support my baby like this i have to cradle my baby in my arms instead many females what they would do because you are anxious you don't know how to feed you you are not able to visualize your breast of who you have never been to that place so there are chances that you might lean forward you might lean forward you might press your breast hard and you might lean forward and press it and you might be like this for hours okay or you are sitting in in such a way where you are bearing down on your coccyx more rather than supporting your back okay. so plus 
uh, you are tired, you will, you will not be sitting feet plant, planted, you would be sitting legs up. So when your legs up and like this, this is the most true posture you can get for your back pain. Okay, so these are the changes. The, the, the diastasis like this, abdominals are weak, posture is being, posture is deviated, ligamental laxity is there, long, long time breastfeeding because initially you can't, you, you are not allowed to, you know, feed the baby in sleeping in lying down position. You cradle them in your hand and you feed or else you just support them on your body and you feed depending upon who is giving you a lactation care, right? So typically seen posture is this, leaning forward on the baby. That's the wrong posture. Okay, always remember one thing. When you, whenever you are explaining anyone breastfeeding, whenever you are explaining anyone about lactation, always remember that the thirsty will go to the well. The well will not go to thirsty. I am the well, my baby is thirsty. The thirsty will come to me. The well will not lean on the thirsty. Okay. So that might be the way you might prevent getting the back pain from a very early thing when we even think of. Okay. And even earlier to that, even during pregnancy, the pregnant females, the way they walk, the way they maintain their ergonomical things. And as I said, that we are all, I have low, I have a weight on my lower limbs. Uh, sorry, I have edema on my lower limbs. So I'm just keeping my legs up and sitting like this. Okay. I know you assume I'm a pregnant female. So I'm keeping my legs up unsupported like this. And I'm sitting like this because my doctor advised me to have feet up and do ankle. Now, all of you, if you can change your position with me, I would like you to change your position from upright sitting. Okay, this is an upright sitting. And this is a slouch sitting. Okay, you yourself can see the lift, the change in my in my pelvic tilt. Second, when I'm upright, when my feet is planted on the ground, my feet are planted, sorry, my feet are planted on the ground. My feet will send mechanoreceptors to my brain that you are into an erect position. You have to maintain the position. You have to tighten your postural muscles. But the moment I'm lifting my legs up, there is no signal passing through my feet. There is no input passing through my feet. So my brain will assume, okay, I'm into a lying down position where I don't have to work against gravity. So let the postural muscle relax because you are lying down. Okay. What are the body changes which will take place? So this is the spine. Okay. So this is how it is. This is an erect sitting. I'm sorry, I'll screw this. Yeah. This is an erect sitting posture. And then this is like you are leaning back. This is an erect sitting and you're leaning back. So when you're leaning back, you're compressing all over your spinal arch. You're removing, you're changing your lumbar lordosis. You're changing multiple things uh, at your spinal alignment. Okay. So positioning the breastfeeding positioning will also be taking it earlier so all I'm these sorry. things will can lead to a should be taken care into the acute postpartum care along with the care of episiotomy pain along with the care of uh, placing the ice pack giving uh, IRR radiations or uh, teaching them simple flicker pelvic floor contractions Okay, so all this will come into the subacute, uh, acute postpartum. Then comes the subacute. Now, subacute would be the time from getting discharged to six weeks, gynec check. Okay, 45 weeks, gynec check, what you're going to take care, whether your sutures are all okay or not, whether you have healed completely or not. Okay, so that would be the immediate postpartum or the subacute phase. So again, in the subacute phase, earlier was the phase how to breastfeed. Like you don't know what the position you have to breastfeed. After you know two weeks time, once your baby starts breastfeeding properly, would be heaviness of the breast. So which uh, generally you would not like wearing a bra because it will you know the wired bra and all this will uh, will inhibit will suffocate you. So you will try not wearing a bra. But when you are not wearing a bra, you are becoming more rounded you are there is no support so giving a proper idea of which bra is in right feet uh what are the feeding bras uh what position if you have to breastfeed lot long hours okay 10 to 12 feeds a day that's 
horrible for a new mom, right? So if you have to sit for a long hours, which position should you take? So all this care, you can further add, and then you can start with maybe bare activation of your muscle fibers, not strengthening, just activation. There's a difference between active movement and activation we are not take, talking about active movement we are talking about activation so maybe you can start with the activation of all the abdominal muscles as well as the pelvic floor muscles as well as the core muscles okay right from the immediate postpartum phase so postural re-education uh, how should be the posture in sitting so thighs fully supported and horizontal feet flat on the floor so as to have a stable base of support Weights evenly distributed on both buttocks. Don't end up into scoliosis. Okay, have a erect posture. A, a dis displayable uh, sitting surface to allow a even weight distribution. Okay, a form type of form surface for even weight distribution, and supporting a spinal curve. So you need a lumbar support to support your spinal lumbar curvature. Okay. Standing, how should be your standing? So even if I'm standing, suppose I'm, I'm breastfeeding a baby, right, in this. So maybe I can have pillows over here, okay? And then I can hold the baby like this, okay? I can have few pillows or there are breast pillows also which are coming, feeding pillows also which are coming, okay? My baby's weight will also increase. So there are there is a natural tendency that I would lean. I will bend like this because breast is heavy, Baby is almost 3.5 or 4 kg weighing and then I have to, uh, it's not like 5 minutes job. It's like when in 40, 30 to 45 minutes job, he will sleep in between. I have to tap him and wake him up. So there are chances I'll naturally lean down. Okay. So if I don't have to lean down, there should be something which is supporting my hand or otherwise I'll end up into trapezius spasm or the thoracic tightness. Okay. So for that, uh, the, the posture in sitting, standing. So feet slightly apart and angled, even weight distribution. Okay? So all these changes will be making sure for the standing as well as lying. Legs not crossed. Just keep a below, below beneath your legs when you are sleeping on sides. Okay, Kneeling. So avoid, iso, avoid sustained isometric trunk flexion or rotations. Try to keep movement in the sagittal plane and perform activities at an appropriate surface height. Okay. Uh, see, these are the examples. Breastfeeding the baby. Okay. In lying down position or maybe in sitting position. You can see here how she has completely supported the baby. So she does not have to lean. She is supporting her back. She is supporting the baby. I don't know whether you are, you are seeing the marker or not. Okay. Supporting the, uh, this and even in lying down. Okay, yeah. you're keeping the head of the baby on your hand and then you're sleeping. So you'll, you end up with a hand pain as well. Okay, so these are very small changes or very uh, micro changes which you need to get into your daily routine. You have to teach your patients instead, like along with core stabilization, along with pelvic floor activation. So no matter how much you activate your core, no matter how much you activate your pelvic floor, ultimately she is sitting like this for half an hour to 45 minutes every two hours. Everything is going to sum up as zero. Okay, So sitting and changing on lap. So don't do this. Instead, you can have like this or a, a, a height which is comfortable to you. Don't hunch forward. So when you are lifting the baby from beneath also, Try not to, you know, hunch and lift. Try to lift in a way or maybe you can have give your baby to someone who is in standing and then you take a support and stand because you are postnatal, immediate postnatal mom. You have, like, you have enough amount of relaxing in your body to loosen up your joint to lead to subluxations. Why you want to, you know, unnecessarily take the undue uh, pressures on your joints so as to lead to low back pain so as to lead to thoracic pain so as to lead to symphysis pubis dysfunctions and all which we would be discussing okay. so maybe the bath time or the car time so all this these are the micro changes as i mentioned should be taken care next thing is you should be able to check the diastasis recti it will usually settle six to eight weeks postpartum once your uh, you know, uterine, uterine involution has happened once your body changes has reverted. So it, it usually settles down six to eight weeks. But if it is not settling, 
does not matter whether you deliver vaginally or through cesarean. There are many people who feel that females delivered through cesarean section will have diastasis rectus. Females delivered through vaginal delivery will not have diastasis rectus. That's not the case. The female who have delivered through a vaginal delivery can even have a diastasis rectus abdominis. Because diastasis erectus abdominis is related to pregnancy. It's not related to the mode of delivery. Okay. So common conditions varies uh, in severity. It will mechanically interfere with supportive and expulsive function of the abdominal walls. It will usually settle with six to eight weeks and retraction to repeat and interact, like what to manage we will be discussing. Okay, and then is low back pain our topic? What it is about? Okay, so we discussed that low back pain can be because of the posture, can be because of the epidural in uh, site, or can be because of the uh, alteration into the COG and LOG, or can be because of the uh, postural changes the female is going through, abdominal muscle weakness or pelvic floor muscle weakness. So all these things can lead to the back pain issues. Epidural side pain. Maybe there is an hematoma formed in the dura or the epidural space. So you can apply hot pack or even ice pack can be used. Whether you would select a hot pack or an ice pack will depend first and the, the most importantly on the comfort of the patient. What she is comfortable with. Either she is comfortable with a hot pack. She needs a soothing effect or she is comfortable with an ice pack. So depending upon her comfort, you can relieve the epidural site pain. Okay. The symphysis pubis pain. Again, symphysis pubis dysfunction is not a very common finding, but it is over ignored once. We do take care of the diastasis rectus abdominis, but we are not considering the symphysis pubis pain. Okay, so symphysis pubis pain can start even earlier in the pregnancy. After the fifth month onwards, there are, as you gain weight, as your abdomen becomes more and more bulky, your baby grows, you will have excessive weight coming upon your symphysis pubis. Okay, so this is you, you can imagine. Okay, this is your pelvis. A non-pregnant female, and then this is the pelvis of a pregnant female. Okay, and plus when now with this, there will be ligamental looseness, there will be relaxing effect, and now when the baby is delivering, okay, at that time also, if uh, the baby's weight is more or there is cephalopubic dissociation. Cephalopubic dissociation means the baby's head is larger than the pub, than the outlet. So if it is, or if it is equivalent to the outlet. So now when the baby passes down, passes out, now because of advanced technology, CPDs are not common. The females don't vaginally deliver with CPD. They generally go for cesareans. But earlier time when the technology was not this advanced, when still the deliveries were happening under the supervision of only unexperienced or uneducated midwives, there were the chances where even a baby with a larger diameter was passing through the, through the vaginal canal and that used to literally distort the pubic symphysis. It used to separate the pubic symphysis or distort the pubic symphysis. Okay, There are two separate words, pubic symphysis dysfunction and pubic symphysis diastasis. Diastasis means a complete separation. Dysfunction means pain. Okay, so diastasis of the pubic symphysis. So one is pain. This is dysfunction, a pain, and this would be a diastasis that it is separated. Okay, or it is separated like this. So more than ten mm, more than ten mm separation between the uh, uh, between the symphysis bone, the, the pubic bones, or the uh, more than ten mm space in the symphysis can be considered as a diastasis symphysis pubis. Okay, so even that can be the in that if it is in pubic symphysis dysfunction, then you can give ultrasound, you can give eyes to heal, you can even give tens, you can give them, uh, you can ask them to avoid the abduction of the lower limbs. Okay, so what what take uh, care to be taken in the case of if it is pubic symphysis dysfunction? Let us see from this case study. So I have kept a case study here so as so that we can understand that what can be the exact rehab approaches for that case study. Okay. So you can see that a 30-year-old female who is married since six years, 
and she has a boy who is one year old clara is her name she is an architecture by profession and she was never off she did not take a day off she is always working she was always working even during her pregnancy and delivery she used to handle the projects with the laptops okay her project she used to handle with the laptop so she had to sit for long and long hours to take care of the work being done okay causative factor of low back pain long sitting hours right she had delivered through a normal vaginal delivery the time at the time of delivery her baby uh at the time of delivery uh she had delivered a baby who was 3 kg weight with a normal vaginal delivery okay so it was just one it was an episiotomy which was made with just one stitch so it was not a very screwed up perineum in her case and but she developed low back pain which increased uh, lately she consulted many orthopedicians physiotherapists and all but she always had an intermittent pain on and off on and off and an and a dull aching pain even while walking even while uh, you know one leg standing and all so it was aggravated by long sitting heavy weight lifting and activities of daily living was relieved by rest and nsaids okay the assessment which we commonly do the assessment if you are getting a patient with low back pain this is definite assessment you will do that is you will see for the body type you will see for the posture so there was no lumbar cervical curvature it was almost a flat back you will check for the pain assessment what is the active uh, level of pain you will check for the muscle dysfunction okay which muscle is weak which muscle is strong and you will check for the lumbar movements so her lumbar movements were all lumbar movements were painful her lumbar rotations was also her range of motion was limited she had a tightness in her hip flexors adductors and piriformis but there wasn't a neurological component involved but she had a stress incontinence and she had a stress incontinence earlier from her pregnancy so before pregnancy also she had experienced that whenever she used to get food poisoning or whenever she used to get um uh, rhinitis or cough and cold she used uh, like during excessive coughing or vomiting she has experienced leakage of urine so stress incontinence was present even before pregnancy so it can give us an idea that maybe this is going towards a weak pelvic floor okay a weak pelvic floor which has worsened post delivery hmm? and we will also check the diastasis rectus in her in clara's case it was two fingers like when you go for an uh, examination you go for a diastasis rectus test and at that time you could feel that it was a two fingers diastasis rectus okay so in supine lying position uh, with, with knees and hips bent when you ask her to lift up and you try to feel the separation it was two finger separation in her case so for a postnatal mother two finger uh is it is still considerable okay it it, it is not like three finger or a major we have a two finger diastasis rectus at the umbilical level um uh, at upper umbilical and lower umbilical there was inter separation only so it was a, like an oval shaped or open from between diastasis rectus which was present what additional examination we did so additional examination we did was we checked for the symphysis pubis we palpated the symphysis pubis and the symphysis pubis had a tenderness okay and we we took hates mmt there is an error in this so her hates mmt was 1 out of 3 so uh, there is an error over here minus 1 out of minus 1 minus 1 minus 3 it's 1 upon 3 so she had a grade 1 of hates mmt uh, out of grade 3 and on female sexual uh, function scale it was uh a, a eight out of a uh, uh, on 50 so her scale was eight of 50 for laxity okay uh for routine physical uh, here there is an error it is in hypotonus and it is one and three not minus one minus three in hypotonus so eight out of the over 50 now routine physical therapy which we generally give or which we are advising would be manual therapy we will be giving manipulation we give stretching we give strengthening exercises we use modalities like traction we use modalities like ultrasound or ift or maybe even spinal compression okay 
and then we shift them to the strengthening exercises. Now, when we are shifting them to the strengthening exercises, at that point of time, we are focusing upon the core. So we are giving, we are asking them to activate their core muscles. We are asking them to, you know, uh, work a like uh, to tighten their pelvic floor, to tighten their abdominals. But uh, is a command right? First of all, second. Do they actually need a pelvic floor strengthening or they need a pelvic floor relaxation? Okay. Do they actually need a strengthening or they need a relaxation? So that depends upon what is the level of involvement of the patient and the pelvic floor. You can have a, you can have a low back pain with a hypertonus dysfunction. You can have a low back pain with a hypotonus dysfunction. Okay, yeah. what do we mean by hypotonus and what do we mean by hypertonus? Hypotonus dysfunction means when your muscles are loose, when your muscles are weak, when your muscles are dysfunctional. Those are the hypotonus. Okay, your muscles are not strong enough to support anything. They are, they are not strong enough to give you a stability. So they give away as in this case. It is a hypotonus. She had urinary incontinence. Okay. Or even there can be a possibility where your muscles are hypertonus. Means they are so tight. They are so spasmodic that they are not able to open. Okay. So you can imagine like this is a pelvic floor. Okay. This is a normal pelvic floor. You ask, you, you give me a command. Okay. Relax. I'm relaxing completely. You give me a command. Contract. I'm contracting completely. Okay. And okay. Okay, leave it. I'm relaxing. Okay. So this is a normal pelvic floor relaxation and contraction. Okay. But if my pelvic floor is like open and you're giving squeeze, 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 and I'm unable to squeeze completely, this is partial squeeze. So this is laxity, weak pelvic floor. Okay. Or my muscles are very tight and you're asking, okay, relax, let it go, relax, let it go. I'm not able to let go then this is a tightness. This is a spasmodic pelvic floor, a hypertonus pelvic floor. So it can be a spasmodic pelvic floor or it can be a completely relaxed and loose pelvic floor or weak pelvic floor, not relaxed, a completely weak or a loose pelvic floor. So this is a hypotonus and this is a hypertonus. If it is hypertonus, it will be tightening up too much. If it is hypotonus, it will be loose lax. So, in either cases, when we talk about the pelvic floor muscles, in either cases of pelvic floor, okay, in either cases of pelvic floor, your muscles can be dysfunctional. They are, they are very tight and they are very tight and they are pulling the coccyx anteriorly. They are giving you a overflexion at the coccyx, leading to coccyx and sacrum dysfunction, leading to sacrum and SI dysfunction. Okay. So either they can be very much tight pelvic floor or they are so, so loose, so weak that they are unable to counterbalance the pressure. Okay, They are unable to counterbalance the pressure. They are unable to support the visceras. They are unable to stabilize the sacral joints. So then they are the loose pelvic floor or the weak pelvic floor. Others are the tight pelvic floor or spasmodic pelvic floor. So in either cases, so when we talk about Core stabilization, okay? Core stabilization does not mean pelvic floor strengthening exercises, okay? Core stabilization means first finding out what component of core is dysfunctional. Second, fixing that component, okay? If you feel your patient has weak pelvic floor, you will go for pelvic floor activation. If you feel your patient has a uh, loo, uh, tight pelvic floor, spasmodic pelvic floor, you will go for pelvic floor relaxation. So depending upon whether your pelvic floor muscles are tight or they are loose, we will be planning our core activation. We will be planning our core stabilization exercises. Okay. In this case, which we are discussing today, this is the case where there was a weak pelvic floor, where there was a um, a hypotonus dysfunction. Along with hypotonus dysfunction, there was a symphysis pubis pain, pain in the symphysis pubis. So 
how can you pul pulpate them? Like in the synthesis which we had, we will be discussing pulpation of synthesis pubis. We will be discussing uh, how to pulpate it and how to grade the level of pain. But in this patient, okay, so she had two things, weakness of the pelvic floor and when we pulpated her pubic synthesis, she had a tenderness on the pubic synthesis. Okay, and she also had a pain when she was one leg standing or walking. Why? Because now you imagine, like this is the pelvic floor. Okay, this is like my pelvis. Right now, I am taking, I am abducting. So what is happening? I am abducting. Can you see what's happening to my pubic symphysis? Or I'm abducting on this side. Sorry, too much abduction. <laughs> I'm abducting on this side. Okay, so what is happening on the synthesis pubis with abduction? It is separating, okay, it is stretching or it is going away. And that's the reason why synthesis pubis dysfunction female will complain of pain on the synthesis in one leg standing or in abduction or in walking. And they can even have an SI pain. Okay, because of the whole chain is dysfunctional. The pubic symphysis, the SI, everything is dysfunctional. Okay, so they can have a pain over the pubic area and even they can have an SI dysfunction also. Fine. So we will be checking for the pubic symphysis dysfunction along with the pelvic floor muscles. And for the pelvic floor, okay, and after that, once we are finding that out, after that, along with whatever uh, rehab we are doing, along with whatever treatment we have already decided, we would be doing with a integrated pelvic floor activation or an integrated core activation, okay? So, along, uh, so when we talk about an integrated pelvic floor activation, what do we mean by an integrated pelvic floor activation? We mean, first, Educating what is core. How should you educate about core? Right. See, there are many females who are, uh, there is one, one another reason why we selected the uh, postnatal uh, uh, low back pain as a topic for today. Okay. Because many physios, when they join us or when they come and when they talk about pelvic floor or when they hear about pelvic floor, they are like, ma'am, in our OPD cases, we hardly see female coming with incontinence or we hardly see female coming with sexual dysfunction. Will we ever be, will we be able to, you know, gain, um, gain patience after doing the pelvic floor course or after doing the workshop on pelvic floor? Okay. So the answer is yes, because you don't have to find the patient with pelvic floor dysfunction. What you have to do is you have to spread the awareness in your existing patients about pelvic floor integration and core okay what is core if i ask you what is what which are the core muscles so so hate sir he always say that if you have to explain core muscles to any patient or core muscles to anyone you explain them with an example of a room you imagine yourself into a room. So these are what's this is a this is Sir's analog. This is how he explains um, the core muscles. So you imagine yourself into the room. Your ceiling, where you have the fan, ceiling fan, is the diaphragm. The muscle at the back is the multifidus. The muscle which is surrounding you from or the wall which is surrounding you from all three sides are the abdominals. And the floor on which your feet on which your feet is for foot is or your feet are that is your pelvic floor so you are into a cavity of pelvic floor okay so diaphragm multifidus tra uh, transversus abdominis abdominal muscles and the pelvic floor so you can imagine you can first educate yourself so any patient whom you are seeing with her low back pain she can be a postnatal mother immediate postnatal mother or she can be any female suffering from low back pain You first explain her what is uh, what is uh, pelvic floor, what is core, okay? And second is you teach her the right pelvic floor activation. 
okay or right core activation right so before that we should know that do they actually need pelvic floor contraction or they do they need pelvic floor relaxation so to palpate and to understand pelvic floor contraction and relaxation we can use hsmmt which we have discussed multiple times and we will be discussing into our hands on workshops as well so hsmmt will give you a complete idea whether your pelvic floor is tight spasmodic or it is weak and loose so first is diagnose your pelvic floor whether what is it suffering from I have seen so many pelvic floor, like so many PTs who are asking the patients to activate the pelvic floor when actually they need to relax the pelvic floor. Okay. So first thing is check the pelvic floor. Second thing is if you want to activate, as in this case, this was a case of a hypotonus pelvic floor. There was a mistake in the slide. So please ignore it was one, grade one and three and hypotonus pelvic floor scale. So this is the case. How will you plan the rehab for this patient? Okay. How will you go for complete core activation? Uh, what would be the commands for core activation? Okay. So let us see the commands for core activation and let us ourselves try to do it. Okay. So those who can do it with me, I would like to demonstrate it to you. So those who can do it with me, kindly follow my commands and do it. Those who cannot, that's okay. You can just view what I'm performing, okay? Just give me two minutes. I will change my position and, and I'll show you the activation. Just two minutes. yeah just a minute taking the position and uh, please all of you those who can be with me those who are at your uh, play for uh, those who are at home and uh, can hear my commands i request you to please uh, come into a supine line position and uh, follow my commands so for a better understanding those who are into the clinical setup, you can just observe. Maybe you can try to activate your core in sitting position. Okay. You can activate your complete core in sitting position. Fine. So uh, generally, whenever we are going for a core stabilization exercises, the common, let us see what are the common mistakes people do in giving commands. Okay. So if I'm in supine, I'm in supine line position, Can you okay? Can you see me? I'm in supine line position right now. Okay. Now, when I'm in supine line position, suppose I'm your patient, okay, or I'm a patient, and you're asking me to activate my core, and I have just flexed my lower limb. I've just flexed my lower limb, right? And these are my abdominal muscles. There are chances that when you give me a command, okay, tighten your abdominal muscles, I might do like this. So it might look in this way. Okay, you can see my abdominals now. I can, instead of activating, see this, this, uh, this is my, pupil, this is my ASIS. So just two, two fingers medial to ASIS, if I'll palpate, this is like, see, 
can you see this? I activated my transversus abdominis. So instead of activating my transversus abdominis, if you give me a command, okay, okay, tighten your abdomen, I can go like, and my TA is not activated. See, I can go deep. My TA is not activated. If I activate my TA, see, I cannot go deep. This, I lost, I lost my TA. This, I activated my TA. Can you see the difference? Can you make out the difference? Okay. So, the, my TA is not active. I'm just trying to uh, suck my abdomen in. There is no activation of TA. Okay, but see this. This is activation of TA. I, can, I cannot go deep. I cannot let my fingers go deep. I have activated. This, there is no TA. Okay, just transfers abdomen. So either I can I can I can just suck my tummy in and there is no pel uh, pore activated, or I can tighten. If you take it, tighten your tummy, then I can tighten my tummy. So I'm bearing down. Okay, I'm bearing down, but again my TA is not activated. See, I can go in. Okay, but if you have to give me a right command for for activating my pel for activating my transverse abdominis, and then activating my pelvic floor. What can go wrong with the pelvic floor? So you're giving me a command. Okay, try to hold your urine in a doing this. So again, this is a wrong. And I'm, I'm, I'm activating my glutes. I'm tightening my adductors. Okay. So instead, what command can you give me? How can you give me? So these are the TA. Okay. You can, you can first tell me that try to pull your belly button down and up towards the spine. So please follow the commands with me. Keep your two fingers just medial to ASIS and breathe in, breathe out. And see, can you see the? Can you see the? Uh, you know, can you see here? Let me do it in this way so it's more easily visible. See, yeah, I activated. I cannot go deeper than this. If I, if I, if I, uh, and now there is no P. I can go deep. Now I have activated. Can you see that, you know, like there is a push on my fingers as soon as the TA gets activated. So I activated my TA. Next, I'm giving you a command that relax. So first, just teach TA activation. Try to pull your belly button back and up towards the spine. Back and up towards the spine and TA is activated. Next, squeeze your PFM. So I squeeze my PF, try to hold, try to breathe out and hold as if you're trying to hold the urine, second step. And third is just a posterior pelvic tilt. Just a posterior pelvic tilt. Now combine all three. Take a deep breath in, breathe out, tighten your TA, tighten your pelvic floor and go for a posterior pelvic tilt. Okay, and come back and relax. Again, TA, pelvic floor, and posterior pelvic tilt. Come back and relax. Are you with me? Yeah? Yes, ma'am. Do you want me to show once again? Sure, ma'am. If you can repeat it, so kindly please uh, repeat all the steps just in one go. Yeah, okay. So, can, would you like to follow with me, please? Sure, ma'am. We are following. Thank you yes, very much. Thank you. Okay. So, okay, I'm again in supine. I'm again in supine line position. I have, like, I have flexed my legs. I have kept my fingers on my, and you can literally do it, you know, keep your finger on TA. Let the patient keep their finger on TA. You can even give a mirror biofeedback. Look, see how your abdomen is responding. The pelvic floor, the muscles, why are we using mirror biofeedback in all the joints? Because what your eyes will see, your brain will know. If you don't know, elephant is gray in color you and you see a random animal going you will not know this is elephant gray in color okay so you need to know and your brain needs to know what the things are your brain needs to see what the things are okay so you tell the patient you are giving a tactile feedback you are giving a visual feedback through the mirror so maybe you can keep a mirror like this and let her see her abdomen 
let her see the tightening of her abdomen when she is doing a right TA activation. So on the count of three, please all, all, with me, all of you, this is palpate your ASIS. Just go two fingers medial to ASIS. Okay, just go medial to ASIS. And take a deep breath in. Breathe out. Tighten your TA. Tighten your pelvic floor. And just go for posterior pelvic tilting. Good. Come back. Release pelvic floor. And come back. And breathe. So let us see it again. I breath out. I, I, I did, did a posterior pelvic tilt. And now I'm breathing normally with my tidal volume, maintaining the maintaining the core and pelvic floor. When I'm doing this, I'm activating my TA, I'm activating my pelvic floor, I activated my multifidus, and I'm breathing with my tidal volume normally. So I'm not creating a valsalva to bear down nor I'm creating a soda can model, nor I'm creating a increase into abdominal pressure and sucking my tummy in. Okay, please, all of you go do once again with me step by step. Take a deep breath in. And please, uh, those who are doing, you let me know when you activate your TA isolatedly, what you feel upon your back. Do you feel a complete activation? And when you are following these steps, what is the difference you feel in both, okay? So, take a deep breath in, breathe out, mm. tighten your abdomen, tighten your pelvic floor, posterior pelvic tilting, and continuously breathe. Hold as long as you can while breathing normally. And relax. Can you feel that when you activated your, your complete core, your transversus abdominis, your pelvic floor, and you did a posterior pelvic tilt, you could feel the activation of the whole core axis, like throughout your spine. Could you feel the activation, a complete activation? It's okay if you cannot breathe right now. Yes, Dr. Dhara, I can feel it. Sorry? I can feel it. I can feel the Great. activation of the core muscles and the uh, spinal muscles also. Great. How are you, Dr. Uzma? Nice seeing you. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> great, great, great. Not getting a chance to uh, practice my leftover. No worries. We will I'm take of the uh, Don't worry. workshop. I have a doubt. Yes. Um, actually, uh, during uh, posterior pelvic tip, the spinal extends our muscles goes for stretch only. Uh, then how it gets activated in posterior so. pelvic tilt now? No, I'm not talking about the extensor. When we talk about the spinal extensors, we are talking about the erector spinae and all the long, long words spinal extensors. When I, when I asked you about the activation, I was asking you about the activation of the interface. The interstitial spinal muscles are the multi. So if we talk about the core stabilization and if we talk about the spinal extensors, there are two, two, two longitudinal spine, like the erector spinae complete plus the multifidus. Now, surprisingly, only the multifidus is considered to be the core activator. Spinal extensors, the long, the erector spinae is not core activator. It is it is working as an extension. So when you are doing a posterior pelvic tilting, what I to talked to you about, at that point of time, we are not saying that you will feel an you will feel a uh, activation of your uh, a spinal extensor. You will feel an activation of your multifidus. So it will be, uh, you need to, that's why I said that if you do not want to breathe along with it, do not breathe. Like when you are learning, it's much to fish, you right, to it, please don't see, uh, just like, yeah. So when you are just learning the activation, try to uh, isolatedly do the movement. So first, if you... You, you can even do it in that way. That first, you can take a deep breath in. 
and just activate your TA in second step. Take a deep breath in, activate your TA and go for posterior pelvic tilting. So when you will go, even in sitting, if you will just try to do it, if you will try to just activate your posterior pelvic tilting, you will feel the activation of the intersegmented muscles. That's what my point was. I thought I think that I couldn't, I didn't place it correctly, and that's why you got confused, Dr. Bhuvana. But I hope that now you are clear with it. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So see, uh, whatever it, it all depends upon how are we giving the commands to the patient and how well the patient is able to understand the command. So the basic thing is, if suppose if this is not the case now, if this was a case which we discussed was for the hypertone, hypotonus, what if the case is there about a hypertonus? So if it is a hypertonus case, we might have to go for pelvic floor relaxations. We might have to go for deep trigger point release. We might have to go for tissue release. We might have to go for coxygeal release as well. Relax the like transrectal coxygeal mobilization also is required because many a times chronic low back pain, when you examine co like the coccyx, coccyx is anteriorly flexed. And that is leading, and that can be a cause of pel, uh, the, uh, um, the, the complete low back pain. Okay. So if that is the case, you need to correct the coccyx. You need to release the coccyx. And then you have to activate your complete core. So the moral of the story or the, the thing which we need to take, uh, take care today is about, or to, to understand today, is about what level of pelvic floor is involved. Don't haphazardly go for core activation by asking the patient to squeeze the PFM. Okay. First, check where is the PFM involved and how much is the PFM involved. And after that, you give them an idea upon how to activate the pelvic floor muscles. So the next question is, how soon can you start the pelvic floor rehab or how quickly can you start the pelvic floor rehab? So the answer to this is say, pelvic floor activation. Uh, the, if you remember the first five minutes of the presentation, I said there is a difference between activity, doing an activity and activating the muscle. Okay. So if we talk about the biceps, if you ask me to activate my biceps, this is biceps activation. I just activated my biceps. Okay. And if you ask me to do the movement of the biceps, then this is the movement of the biceps. Okay. Similarly, in the pelvic floor, what we term by activation, we see pelvic floor muscles, they do not have a vast range of movement the way we have for the other skeletal muscles. Okay, But pelvic floor muscles has different types of muscle fibers. Those are the fast twitch muscle fibers, the slow twitch muscle fibers. Okay, So the fast twitch muscle fibers are quick contractions. So if I ask you, all of you, to uh, please be with me for some time. I'm oh, sorry, I just lost the track. Yeah, and I know that we have we have already you know uh, exceeded the time plus plus, but please be with me. So when we talk about the pelvic floor uh, activation or when we talk about the pelvic floor contraction, by that we mean you can you don't you um you start activating. So at least you can do is quick contractions flickering contractions so right now when you are uh, you are with me try to take a deep breath in breathe out and go and try to go for just squeeze and relax don't hold see there are two things oh, sorry there are three things one is quick another is squeeze relax squeeze relax and third is squeeze hold 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 and relax so this squeeze Hold, 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 hold is your endurance. This is your fast twitch. What I'm talking to you is just activation. Squeeze one, relax one. Squeeze one, relax one. So you can start with pelvic floor activation. Okay. Or minimal movement of pelvic floor muscles. You can even explain the patient in a way that suppose you are at the baseline. Okay, so like this is the pelvic floor. This is the baseline. So this is the baseline. So this, if you do, this is first floor. 
this is the third floor so you just come to first floor and relax come to first floor and relax don't go for third floor hold and let go okay why because initially if suppose it is a cesarean section if it is a cesarean section and the female is upon catheterization then you should not do pelvic floor activities so do not activate your pelvic floor muscles if there is a catheter in situ okay it can be for the neurological cases it can be for the any operative cases do not go for pelvic floor activation with catheter in situ so catheter usually gets removed after 24 hours in cesarean section again depending upon the severity of the condition so if the catheter is removed after 24 hours you can start with pelvic floor exercises okay you might even if she is comfortable if the gynec is allowing her because there will be vaginal bleeding she will have even if it is a cesarean section she can have bleeding and females with cesarean section can even bleed for 14 days to 15 days it does not mean that yeah okay cesarean is there everything is removed so they, they will not bleed okay if i talk about many of my patients vaginal delivery patient she she uh, was off her pads within seven days but one case of cesarean section she had to use her pad for 14 days it, it is it varies physiology to physiology person to person so with pads with vaginal bleeding if she is comfortable you can immediately start the pelvic floor even contraction the whole contractions as well in cesarean if it is a uh, vaginal delivery case if there is an episiotomy then she might have episiotomy pain she might have uh, dysfunction over the perineum so in that case do not go for long holds okay but you can just go for flicker contractions just squeeze come to first floor go down squeeze come to first floor go down okay so that uh, uh, slow activation or contractions we can definitely start we can definitely start so uh, i would like all of you to do this with me so that we can understand the things clearly okay. all of you breathe in and breathe out and when you're breathing out when you're breathing out just squeeze minimal come to first floor and relax squeeze one relax one squeeze one relax one okay now squeeze hold squeeze as hard as you can squeeze very good relax squeeze squeeze very good complete contraction relax so this was a complete pelvic floor contraction and what you did earlier was just an activation just activated your muscle fibers and now go for quick contractions flicker of contractions these are the flickers could you understand the difference yes ma'am yes ma'am yes, ma yes, ma yes so we can start all these different types of pelvic floor activation exercises right as soon as the gynex give you an approval okay and along with this, you can start with the core activation. So even if it is a cesarean, see in the cesarean section, she, she, she will have seaside, she will have seaside pain, the cesarean section side pain. You can brace that and don't ask her to uh, you know go for crunches or, or go for any movement, but you can start with the activation. Activation is just, just simple breathing, just diaphragmatic breathing. And at the end of diaphragmatic breathing, try to activate your TA. Even if it is activating for a minute, for a second, that's enough. Okay. Second is you can go for abdominal corset. So if you are going for abdominal corset and if you are going for or maybe a sari or like like in india we generally wrap a sari around or maybe you now to we have cloths also you wrap around or a corset that corset is giving you an additional or a supportive stability it's mechanically bringing the fibers close together so it will help the muscles to work better against gravity 
इट विल हेल्प द मसल्स टू गेन देयर स्ट्रेंथ बैक सो गो फॉर कोर एब्डोमिनल कोर्सेट अगेन एब्डोमिनल मेनी गायनेक्स रेफर एब्डोमिनल कोर्सेट आफ्टर सिक्स डेज लाइक लाइक फॉर द वजाइनल डिलीवरीज एंड मेनी ऑफ देम विल नॉट अलाउ द यूजेज ऑफ द कोर्सेट्स फॉर वन मंथ टिल द टाइम द सीजेरियन स्कार्स आर हील्ड so if you the and the corsets are generally you can uh, take your gynex opinion if it is a cesarean scar unhealed oozing take her opinion and then you can give so the the major reason for adding the pelvic floor or adding the core stable or understanding of core is not just you know uh, doing a routine back care instead you can have a unique reputation you can stand out differently because she came to you for back pain but you did a complete you just did not let yourself stuck with the only the you know the typical back pain protocol instead you took an effort to understand her pelvic floor you took an effort to understand what is either it is a tight pelvic floor or a weak pelvic floor and then you treated it okay so there are chances you might have internal reference like your patient can refer another patient or the your patient can refer to four more patients you can develop your practice in the field of women's health also you are basically doing back pain you are an ortho specialist you are a neuro specialist you are treating back pain what you did you just took an extra effort in explaining them what is core and explaining them what is pelvic floor you examined their pelvic floor and now you got one now you are able to solve the problem in a better way there are so many patients with back pain who have constipation but we are not considering it as an even in our assessment many of us we just overlook overlook constipation saying that okay it is dietary or it is habitual no it can be due to pelvic floor dysfunction so try to understand what are pelvic floor dysfunctions or try to understand what can you do differently and you enhance your practice in women's health or in the field of pelvic floor okay so yeah this was this was an webinar which was directed to give you an idea about where the pelvic floor dysfunctions can lead to back pain and can back pain be associated with pelvic floor okay uh, we are coming to as i said earlier we are coming to dubai on um, 8 uh, like 18th and 19th of march and our hands uh, like online module is starting from 9th of march if someone is interested they can join us uh, for the 9th of march and uh, uh in this like the complete premium intensive female pelvic floor rehab the certification program is accredited by dubai health authority and in that there are multiple things which we are offering there is level 1 that is non invasive female pelvic floor dis practitioners there is level 2 premium intensive workshop on pelvic floor rehab um then there are also online modules which are available on reproductive health pcod pcos endometriosis infertility so that would be covered into the reproductive health and female sexual dysfunction the in detail like uh, desire disorders arousal disorders uh, disorders with uh, hyper uh, hypersexuality nympho uh, um, pgad nymphomania so their rehab so all that would be into the female uh, sex health rehab and the reproductive health rehab and it is only available at uh, like this is the special thanks goes to learnovit for uh, offering this course which is of ad 7000 to 2500 and uh, for the people who attended the vaginismus they were giving additional uh, 250 ad off i'm sure they would have some offers for the people who attended the postnatal uh, uh, webinar as well so you can contact learnovit if you want to join us for dubai uh, workshop on 18th and 19th of march starting from 9th of march are the online sessions and uh, it is accredited with dubai health authority right so uh, thanks learnovit for you know organizing such wonderful webinars and workshops uh, due to the time constraint we just had one of our if i speak upon back pain i can speak a lot lot and lot we can do lot of things even in back pain where you can maybe either go for a transrectal release also in cases of back pain but um, looking at the time constraints would not like to go in detail the idea for the webinar was just to you know give you an insight that it's not so that pelvic floor you need to go and look for the pelvic floor cases 
you can have your back pain based cases who already are dysfunctional and you just all you need is just five minutes extra in your consultation and talk with them about core because they are the ones who are suffering they are the ones who need help but they don't know where to go so thank you for like there are a lot many uh, questions and i can see into the chat box i hope you enjoyed the session today also looking forward to meet you all personally and uh, yeah this workshop which we will be doing will be exclusively from a female from a female instructor to the female participants there would not be any cross gender trans gender and transsexual training or the treatment we strictly follow hppg guidelines okay and as i gave you an introduction of wow i free we are the only government recognized institute with a legitimate dipp number for uh, transgenital transsexual pelvic floor rehabilitation we are training doctors in across 13 countries now uh, the book i told about because this is all about it uh, thanks all of you for joining us and uh, thank you very much for uh, you know being with us for this one hour and rather being with us throughout the journey thanks to learnovate people for organizing the webinars like this and uh, all the participants for joining us and thank you, thank you. for giving this vision to us and making sure that you know pelvic floor, pelvic floor dysfunction should not be left unaddressed thanks for uh, thank you so much uh, dr dhara for such an uh, informative session um, this was uh, really very uh, fruitful for all of us and uh, thank you all the participants for joining in and uh, you can uh, just uh, contact us if you want to register for the course thank you dr dhara ma'am may i get the contact number actually we are from south india uh, i want to join in future workshop webinars Sure, dear. So, contact uh, details. Yeah, you can maybe write. Webinar, my... I must. Yes. One so, second. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Husseini Mubarak. You will have to leave because the session is only for uh, female participants. So my uh, mobile number is eight triple zero five two one five zero three. Eight triple zero five two one five zero three. Ah, Damalat. Ah, Actually, I joined lately today because of the network issue. I may I get the link for this recorded video or something? This video. Maybe you can uh, contact Learnovate. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Uh, I Some would just have a ask. doubt. Yes, Sorry. Yes. No, if no, you're going how to send the us posture? the details. How is the posture? Number one. Shall I? Hello. Ma'am, how the posture influences the pelvic floor weakness or tightness? See, postural chain it's, is, is very much uh, linked in detail. Okay. So, I will not take much of your time, but just a simple connection. Um, Maybe pelvic tilt, posterior tilt and anterior tilt. The anterior tilt, posterior pelvic tilt, yes. And along with that, the strain, like when your when your pelvic floor is tight or when your pelvic floor is in spasm, it will lead to coccygeal overflexion. So when the coccygeal overflexion is there, it will lead to sacral counter nutation, like posterior yes. tilt in the sacrum. And that will affect your SI joints. That is one thing. Secondly, when your pelvic floor is into spasm or your pelvic floor is tight or dysfunctional, it is connected with the fascia of obturator internus. And obturator internus is the muscle which is connecting to the appendicular system, the lower limbs. So it will restrict. So you can even see that the patients with hip rotation, like if they have 
extremely uh, tight internal rotators or external rotators even they can present with low back pain even they can present with pelvic floor dysfunction its third link is through the si joint your sorry your symphysis pubis so if you have a symphysis pubis weakness or if you have a sorry if symphysis pubis dysfunction that can also lead to the uh, overall affection of the pelvic corset so i would like i would like to do one thing uh, you can all share your email ids with learnovate and we might we will be sharing you the articles related to the core stability and pelvic floor over there okay yeah so you can maybe read and understand it hi dr nandita i just saw you it's, it's so nice seeing you again i hope you are doing great nandita i think she left uh, yes doctor we had someone one more person to ask a query Dr. Sandra? Uh, yes, I was asking if you're going to send us uh, all the information about the training happening in the UAE on our emails, that will be great. Sure, Dr. Sandra. So you can just uh, note down your email addresses with Learnovate. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Mrs., uh, Ms. Mariam is there from Learnovate with us. So she yes, can Yeah, so she can maybe jot down everyone's email address and we will be keeping you updated with the uh the information and others uh about the workshops as well as the postability okay thank you thank you sure thank you so much uh, uh dr dhara for your time and uh, such an informative session and uh, hope to see you soon in dubai for more such informative sessions thank you thank you very much Thank Hi, Dr. You. Maria. I'm seeing so many people after a long time. Hi, Dr. Maria. Nice meeting you also. Nice seeing you also. Didn't meet you in person. Hope to meet you in person this time. Okay. So, shall we wind up the session then? Yes. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care. Take care.